for our scripture reading this morning. It's taken out of section 11, <clears throat> verses 4 and 5. Behold, I speak unto you, and also to all those who have desires to bring forth and establish, establish this work. And no one can assist in this work, except he shall be humble and full of love, having faith, hope, and charity, being temperate in all things, whatsoever shall be entrusted to his care. Behold, I am the light, of, light and life of the world that speaketh these words. Therefore, give heed with your might, and then you are called. Good to be with you this morning. Uh, thank you for the music, ladies. Um, we were in the back standing waiting to come out and could hear the uh, song, His Eyes on the Sparrow, and uh, that brought, brought back good memories for me um, when I was a youngster. <clears throat> to some of you, I still am. Uh, <clears throat> we had an old cassette tape of, of an old singer, Tennessee Ernie Ford, that we would listen to, and he would sing that song. <clears throat> that uh, uh, touched me. Uh, some of you know that uh, this past week has been a little bit rough uh, for me. Um, uh, I've had some kidney stone issues, and um, some of you probably know that's not a very comfortable thing. And so <clears throat> as I um, went through the week, it, it, uh, it's gotten better. Um, but it started out uh, Monday, and I told Brian in the back before we came out that I, I really I have to blame him uh, for this. <clears throat> that may sound strange, but uh, Monday morning, uh, I got in the truck and, and uh, one of the guys that works with me, and we headed to go downtown and see Brian on a job site, and, and that's when it really all started was when we got in the truck, so I, <clears throat> I have to give him uh, all the credit for that, I guess. Um, later in the week, uh, I think it was Thursday, uh, Dale called me and, and wanted to know what I thought about possibly getting a backup speaker, and I said, well, that is probably a good idea, just in case. <clears throat> so he, he talked to Dave, and they, uh, I assume, worked that out. <clears throat> um, and so Thursday evening, um, I got home late uh, from work and, and uh, was administered to, and, and from that point forward, uh, Friday was a little better, and Saturday was even a little better than that, so uh, I, I feel fine this morning. <clears throat> but uh, at the end of this, if any of you find yourselves thinking that maybe you wish you could have heard the backup speaker, whomever that may have been, uh, just let me know, and I'll see what I can do about it next time. <clears throat> but I want to start by reading uh, to you a statement published by the church uh, some years ago. Uh, it was in a little pamphlet uh, titled Beliefs That Matter, and uh, some of you may be familiar with that. But it says, we believe also that men belong together and that truly Christian men must and will work together for the establishment of the kingdom of God here on earth. This kingdom is a spiritual achievement gradually wrought out under the direction of divinity through those especially called to this work. As the kingdom is more fully achieved, a constantly growing number of men and women will give of their best and receive according to their needs. In communities where the will of God is law and where enlightened brotherhood is the prevailing spirit, this is Zion. And we know that Christ uh, spent more time talking about uh, and referring to the kingdom of God or Zion than any other topic. And that's what we'll spend our time this morning uh, talking on, uh, the kingdom and its principles. And through the restoring of Christ's church here on earth, the kingdom building program has been put into place. And this, this morning as we go along, um, I'll quote several, uh, several men, um, F.M. Smith and uh, Evan Fry, uh, several others, and I'll try to uh, make mention of that when it's appropriate. But I think it's good that we uh, consult the writings and, and consider the thoughts of those modern day uh, leaders in the church um, uh, for their insight and enlightenment um, that we can uh, gain for our day, I think, is invaluable, 
in, in the present situation that we find ourselves in in the church, uh, I think it's also good that we um, look to those things that uh, the direction that they gave, um, even though it was for some of them long ago, uh, it's still valuable today. Bishop uh, Delap said this, <clears throat> while it is not an easy task to which we have committed ourselves, it is one which, in my opinion, is within the range of possible achievement. Progress toward its attainment will be in proportion to our consecration, to the exercise of our agency, and to our compliance with the basic laws per pertaining to Zion and its establishment. Many of us have a heritage in the church uh, that goes back far beyond us, perhaps generations upon generations. Um, each of us are, are different in that. Um, but whether you, you do or don't, it doesn't uh, really matter because the message is the same. And this gospel work is a fraternity of relationships and friendships. It's been divinely planned that way so that we can enjoy the social program of working together in common purpose. We're a family, a family of God. We're his children. We are to bring about his purposes on earth and invite our fellow man. So take some time, uh, some time um, when you think about it, and, and just think about the connections that you have uh, here with your church family and, and even outside this place. And, and that fraternity that you share uh, as a group. Psalms 133 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And how can we help but uh, consider this fraternity a blessing and, and all the privileges and, and uh, um, all those things that come along with that closeness that we share? And how often do we stop and ponder the ways in which we are blessed? Is it only on special occasions, holidays, once a day, once a week, once a month, or even only once a year? Without the freedoms that we enjoy in this land, our struggle to see his kingdom established would be even more elusive than it may already seem. So let us not take for granted the help that God has uh, provided through freedom. Freedom helps provide the way to the kingdom. Of course, if we're not careful, freedom can facilitate lethargy and complacency. Because of its undeniable quality of choice, freedom provides choice, and choice provides an avenue to sanism or ruin. We can choose to be a lot of different things, and we can choose to embrace certain behaviors or attitudes, good or bad. It could go either way depending on our choice. But we know God does not force himself upon us and that he wants us to choose him. And we live in this free land where we should have no excuse holding us back from the church's commission, which is to evangelize the world and Zionize the church. But the erosion of time in our lives is certainly a problem in our kingdom building work. I think we could all attest to that. <clears throat> time seems to be a natural enemy to man it would appear that no matter how hard we try, we never have enough time. An individual response is required in order to, order to determine whether or not we should have had enough time. God grants us our agency and how each one uses his or her time is part of that agency. It's a choice. And we know one thing, um, once it's spent, you can't get it back, can you? It's gone. We see this in the lives of our children and how fast they grow up and in the blink of an eye, time has eluded us. Brother Roy Cheville said, think big, get busy. That's pretty simple, isn't it? And I know I've talked about before, uh, Apostle Glazer uh, said in reference uh, to the fact of people saying that we will have to wait on the Lord to bring Zion and that we're not good enough to do it, that he got frustrated at this attitude and he said, maybe we're not good enough but God requires that we become good enough. And he goes on to say that God would not and does not require from us that which is impossible to accomplish. <clears throat> Section 102. Uh, verse 2. Behold, I say unto you, were it not for the transgressions of my people, speaking concerning the church and not individuals, they might have been redeemed even now. But behold, they have not learned to be obedient to the things which I require at their hands, but are full of all manner of evil and do not impart of their substance as become a saints to the poor and afflicted among them. 
and are not united according to the union required by the law of the celestial kingdom. And Zion cannot be built up unless it is by the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. Otherwise, I cannot receive her unto myself. And my people must needs be chastened until they learn obedience. <clears throat> and that's, that's pretty harsh. Um, but as a people, we know that it's our uh, duty to uh, exercise our faith, and it's, it's uh, our calling to become righteous. And those who have faith will move forward to accomplish that which they believe. In other words, that which we envision, we will to accomplish. Brother Evan Fry was the church's uh, radio minister for 18 years, from 1940 to 1958. And he, he had a little saying that he said, uh, said, you can't pour a gallon of water into a half pint teacup. We do it a little at a time. And how true that is but shouldn't we at least start pouring? I re recently read an article uh, that was published in the Restoration Voice uh, by Brother Fry, and it was titled, How Will the Kingdom Come? And in it, he talks about two different kinds of people, each having a different idea of how the world uh, will be saved. And I suspect most of us fall into one of these categories, at least in part, but one says that man is the center of the universe, and with his intelligence and skill will save the world. The other is that suddenly and miraculously the kingdom will come and that God will do it all. Man will sit back in awe and wonder, never lifting a finger. And I'm, I'm not sure which train of thought is more dangerous. Uh, these ideals lack faith and limit God. But he has no reason to be anything but patient and wait for mankind to accept and get behind his program. Brother Fry points out, but you and I cannot afford to wait long. Our time is limited to this life. It is for the deeds done in the body, not in the spirit, that we shall be judged in the great day of judgment. And he goes on to say that we should be increasingly aware of our need for haste in the building of God's kingdom. And he quotes another writer in, in the article that says that God cannot build the golden age out of leaden men. <clears throat> Apostle uh, G.G. Lewis wrote this little excerpt uh, that comes out of a, a larger article that was published in the Saints Herald many years ago. But Zion will not drop down out of the skies. We will not wake up one fine morning and see the sparkling city without doing our part. We must be Zion builders in our time if we would, would participate in the protection that it will afford. Therefore, we should prepare for Zion. Our lives will need a good deal of, of overhauling. There is no place for ill feeling, squabbles, or individual differences. We must work in harmony with God's laws, his church, and those who duty, whose duty it is to lead. Some are advanced, ready perhaps to enter into Zionic conditions, but many need to make greater preparation spiritually and economically. Let not the parable of the empty oil lamps apply to us. So we know that Zion will not simply just be dumped in our lap. Uh, that's, that's evident. That's apparent. But are we doing anything to to promote it. <clears throat> President Fred M. Smith uh, had many writings and, and many uh, sermons that he gave. And uh, he gave one to the church uh, a long time ago. And, and he says this, that our church has been working toward the time when an order with religious foundation may and will be established in which the social principles of the Christian religion will have full play. Believing all men, because of the functions of fraternity, are laborers together with God. We cannot but believe that there is close tie between labor and religion. And that religion and those who promote religion should be concerned about laborers and laboring conditions. That religion is a power which promotes universal brotherhood. That religion is for the laboring man as well as the entrepreneur. And that the church should be a power not only in furnishing soul comfort in times of personal distress, and untoward conditions of individual, but even a stronger power in bringing about improvement in conditions under which the more physically onerous tasks of work are born. And he goes on to say that the work must go on and define stewardship as follows. It's an unreserved devotion of time, talents, and possessions to the service of deity in and through the church. All are called and we must assist them as they answer that call. Section 85, 
uh, verses 20 and 21. Behold, I will hasten my work in its time, and I give unto you who are the first laborers in this last kingdom a commandment, that you assemble yourselves together and organize yourselves and prepare yourselves and sanctify yourselves. Yea, purify your hearts and cleanse your hands and your feet before me, that I may make you clean, that I may testify unto your Father and your God and my God, that you are clean from the blood of this wicked generation, that I may fulfill this promise, this great and last promise which I have made unto you when I will. Also I give unto you a commandment that ye shall continue in prayer and fasting from this time forth. And I give unto you a commandment that you shall teach one another the, the doctrine of the kingdom. Teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you, that you may be instructed more perfectly in theory, in principle, in doctrine, in the law of the gospel, in all things that pertain unto the kingdom of God, that is expedient for you to understand. And we, <clears throat> we've talked before, um, uh, when I've been in this position, um, about the body of Christ being complacent. And I just wanted to uh, share a little little bit of information that the church uh, came out with uh, in regards to complacency and some things that we can do to, uh, to um, keep from being complacent. <clears throat> and they, it, it's a simple plan. Uh, they lay it out simply. Uh, but it's one of those things that we should give a lot of consideration to. But they say that we must spiritualize our lives by religious living, pure thinking, clean conversation, and daily prayer at the family altar. That we must pre prepare ourselves for work in the church by daily study of its books and papers and other good writings. That we must attend church regularly and help maintain the dignity and beauty of the services by reverent conduct that we must give willingly of our talents and labor whenever and wherever we are needed in the work, and that we should support the church by continuous and conscientious compliance with the financial law. So they give us <clears throat> four answers or ways to combat complacency in our religious experience. And number one would be right living, um, doing those things that uh, would cause our minds and hearts to be in the right place. Number two would be prayer. We know that uh, our prayer life is uh, vital to our success. Number three would be study. And as we've, we've mentioned, uh, there's a lot of things that we can study, uh, the scriptures uh, and then various other writings that would be uh, complementary to the scriptures. And number four, to support the church's programs through stewardly living, which means in, in all aspects, uh, not just financially, but in, in our support of, of uh, attendance and uh, doing those things, becoming involved in those programs that uh, are a part of the, the life of the church. Uh, these things we must be about daily and regularly. And I have to ask myself if I am, and, and then it would be wise if you ask yourself if you are. Section 141. Uh, verse 7 each should, should strive prayerfully for sustained and greater devotion to the work whereunto he is called my servant should not become weary of well doing the adversary is quick to discourage and thus destroy their effectiveness the church is admonished again that joint responsibility is laid on all. Properly and equally born, this responsibility will ensure success. The consummation will be glorious and all will share in that glory. Apostle uh, J.A. Gillen, he was a president of the Twelve, um, wrote an article in the Saints Herald <clears throat> and it was titled, To the Mountaintop. We are told that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This being true, we have reason to believe he is ready and willing to lead us into higher planes, more wholesome altitudes where our vision of Christ might be enlarged. enlarged. Our faith in the cause of Zion increased. He, no doubt, desires 
to lead us away from the miasma of doubt and fear, from sin and its related evils such as greed, lust, and unholy ambitions, which result in suffering, sorrow, and distress. Jesus desires to lift us far above all earthly things into the rightful heritage of the saints. For this very purpose, the Son of God was manifest, low to destroy the works of sin and to bring about Zion. This was a responsibility placed upon Christ. If the saints of God are to collaborate with him, uh, as provided in the law, this then is the great objective of the church. Christ has issued a program by which this is to be brought about. No other plan can be successfully substituted. Any attempt to do otherwise is but to invite failure. The whole matter can be crystallized in the following. Keep my law, change not the ordinances and sacraments. Thou shalt love the, the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Do this, and thou shalt live. The antithesis would follow. <clears throat> Failing to do this, death ensues, and any course other than the one offered by Jesus Christ would be idolatry. The above can be gathered up in the objectives of the church, which are of dual character, and to which the church is committed, to evangelize the world through the preaching of the gospel of Christ and to bring about Zion. To this task, the church must set its face and organize its forces. To the extent we face in this work of Jesus Christ has failed as far as we are concerned. What then shall I say in representing the leading quorums of the church? In answer first to the law and to the testimony, keep the commandments, have faith in God, Christ, and the cause we have espoused. If possible, secure the mind of Christ. Avail ourselves of the promised equipment. <clears throat> Reconsecrate ourselves to our great task. Make the necessary sacrifice so that the cause of Christ shall be lifted to the extent that the honest in heart will see our good works in consequence of which God shall be glorified. <clears throat> in order that the church shall come to its rightful estate, new spiritual depths must be sounded. Forces latent and untried should be mobilized. Godly leadership made manifest in every quorum as well as every department. That the whole body shall be full of light and power, a church so in harmony with the program of life that its way indeed be a building fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple in the Lord, a habitation of God through his spirit, a Zion out of which the perfection of beauty God will shine. <clears throat> and we... Uh, we go to Colorado uh, regularly. We spend a lot of time out there. And when we're out there, we uh, do a little hiking ourselves, and um, we see a lot of hikers uh, going up the mountainside. We see a lot of people climbing mountains. Um, and there's a lot of effort that goes into uh, that hobby. Um, there's a lot of time that you have to put into preparing yourself for that. <clears throat> uh, I, I am not the most prepared uh, Physically, anyway, I don't put a lot of time into that part of it, but uh, there's a lot of things that you have to do. You have to prepare your pack and make sure that you have all the things that you need um, to, to take on that task, uh, the things that would be required if there was an accident so that you're prepared, uh, a little food just in case you get hungry along the way or at the end uh, and you need to take a snack. Uh, you've got to have water, uh, all the things, the proper shoes, the, the proper clothing, uh, all the things that go into uh, going on a hike, <clears throat> whether it be a short hike or a, a long hike. Some some of the guys here in the congregation uh, do a lot of hiking and, and stay for days and nights on end. Uh, there's a lot that goes into that. And that's a, that's a great hobby. Um, but I wonder, <clears throat> when, when we think about um, our spiritual mountain that we have to climb, do we put as much effort into uh, what it would take to be prepared to do that as we would if we were going to take a physical hike uh, in the Rocky Mountains, so, so let's just say. Um, but you can think about uh, your favorite formation, uh, mountain range, or, or whatever it may be that, uh, that you've hiked in in the past and, and what all went into that. And, uh, what an experience that is when you do get to the to the summit or to the end of your trail and uh, <clears throat> how good you feel and, and, and you get to take in the sights and, and see all the things that, uh, that God's created around you. And I know, I know it's, a, it's kind of a, a simple uh, analogy, but uh, 
the same applies with our spiritual walk. And when we get, when we climb the mountain and we get to the top, uh, wouldn't, won't that be such a glorious experience? <clears throat> Brother Oakman, um, used to talk about his father, uh, who was a plumber and, uh, he had a plumbing business, uh, that he owned and, uh, <clears throat> he said that his father one time heard, uh, President Frederick Smith uh, speak, and his talk was on the idea of doing your very best in all that you do. And he says that his father, from, uh, from that time forward, did so in his plumbing work. And that within a few short uh, years, he went, uh, word got around, and he went from, from just employing himself to having 11 master plumbers that worked for him. And he ended up becoming the largest plumbing business in North London. And that's, that's a simple thought, but um, it's a lot more complicated than, than, than just that simple little story. Um, because doing our best requires an awful lot. But don't we think that uh, we deserve, or that our Heavenly Father deserves our best? Uh, the question might be, do we love him enough to, to give him our very best? Fred M. Smith uh, gave another sermon that I want to read a portion of to you. Um, he said, that In the early days of our church, our people and our ministers in great unity, developed by earnest zeal to spread the gospel, were intensely active, and they met persecution from without, and this enhanced their solidarity and even augmented their zeal. And under the complex impulsion of divine instruction and guidance, order which could not be dampened, and the elan of fine unity of purpose and ideals, a fraternity was developed which carried the church forward rapidly. <clears throat> he says, today there is far less of religious persecution brought to bear upon us, and we may lack this factor tending to unify us, but the pressure of economic uncertainty, the sense of religious confusion in other churches, and not so well direction by the ideal of economic betterment through churchly fraternity, will, if we properly sense its importance, function towards the promotion of solidarity, as did persecution previously. For our conception of Zion and her religious and social ideals still sets us out as a peculiar people. It is a bonding force lacking in other church organizations. But for the idea of Zion, so to function, there must be among us a pervasive understanding of its principles and an all-absorbing zeal for its accomplishment. The fraternity to which is so lacking generally today is foundationally necessary for Zionic development. To engender, expand, and then preserve that fraternity is the great task of this church. We may be small in numbers, but we are great in our ideas of making the gospel of Jesus Christ a socially stabilizing force by giving it full expression in the lives of men as church members, citizens, artisans, laborers, businessmen, students, and even those who have leisure time. Zion with stewardship as the fundamental and the pervasive dynamic will be the means of stabilizing society through fraternity and religion. As members of the church, what part would you play in the great task? May God inspire your answer. And that was his question <clears throat> to the church at that time. And we know that we must have faith in God that he will change men's hearts and minds as we strive to serve mankind through him. Brother Fry said that faith is a principle of life. It's not passive or negative or quiescent. It is active, dynamic, constructive, affirmative, aggressive. It is the principle which moves men to great achievement, to noble living, to the conquest of evil. Faith is reliance, trust, confidence, hope, assurance. Faith is betting your life that there is a God and trusting him to supplement the best effort which you can muster with his power to complete what you have begun in his name. Faith is the principle which binds men to God for action. <clears throat> uh, section 12, familiar scripture. Behold, the field is wide already to harvest. Therefore, whoso desireth to reap, let him thrust in his sickle with his might, and reap while the day lasts, 
that he may treasure up for his soul everlasting salvation in the kingdom of God. Yea, whosoever will thrust in his sickle and reap, the same is called of God. Therefore, if you will ask of me, you shall receive. If you will knock, it shall be opened unto you. <clears throat> Do we have the faith that it takes to open doors of opportunity? Do we have faith to be a doorway of opportunity for your fellow man? Um, Or do we have the faith that it takes to be an avenue to Christ, who is the avenue to the Father, so that individuals seeking him out may find him? And do we have the faith that it takes to be an avenue to Christ for the individual that doesn't yet know that they're seeking him out? Faithfully believe on him and take action. You can turn to it if you'd like. I'm just going to read the words to the hymn. Uh, consecration, which is number 312 in the uh, blue hymnal, if you'd like to follow along. Unto God, who knows our every weakness, with faith we lift our hearts in prayer, asking in humility and meekness for his love, his direction, and his care. Though the task be great that lies before us, we trust in one divinely strong. Knowing well, at last we'll be victorious, we will pray that the time will not be long. Lord, accept the humble consecration of our lives, our talents to thy cause, till thy word is preached in every nation, and all men have a knowledge of thy laws. In these latter days, with songs of praise, we all must help to spread the gospel story. Our every deed from sin be freed, till Zion we redeem. Section 143, uh, <clears throat> sorry, 142. The hopes of my people and the goals of my church, while not yet fully realized and at times and to many seemingly distant, are closer to realization than many recognize. It is yet day when all can work. The night will come when for many of my people opportunity to assist will have passed. <clears throat> God's gift to man was to promote peace. This peace will be enhanced by each of us learning more effectively the fundamentals of altruism. To sense that to the extent of our abilities, each is his brother's keeper, is a step towards greater peace. To give is divine, to give divine purpose is great. Let brotherly love prevail, but may that fraternal regard issue in greater consecration to our common cause, and that best interest of loved ones is best promoted when the best interest of all are conserved by consecration to the plan and organization God has given us at the means of achieving his purposes. Zion is calling us, and Zion fully established will be a potent factor in bringing about conditions where God's will will be done on earth. Fred M. Smith said that. Uh, in a Christmas message. <clears throat> in closing, I'd just like to read uh, a short scripture from section 12. Seek to bring forth and establish my Zion. Keep my commandments in all things, and if you keep my commandments and endure to the end, you shall, shall have eternal life, which gift is the greatest of all the gifts of God. May God bless each of us as we actively strive to do our part, is my prayer.